So uh, welcome to a um, conversation between myself, um, Edward Luce, um, and Nathan Law, one of um, Hong Kong's leading dissidents, if, if you like, um, now based in London. Um, I, I should mention, um, Nathan, and to the rest of you, that uh, I, I used to, I, I did a stint on the South China Morning Post, Hong Kong's main um, English language paper, um, and I've taken great interest in Hong Kong ever since. But it um, struck me that was in 1991, and it struck me that was two years before Nathan was born. Um, so, Nathan, you're making me feel um, very old. Um, great to be um, on here with you. Um, for those who don't know Nathan Law, he was one of the most prominent members of the Occupy Central, the Umbrella movement in 2014 that was pushing for, um, that was protesting against um, attempts to make the Hong Kong system even less democratic. He was then, in 2016, elected as the youngest ever um, member to the Hong Kong LegCo, the Legislative Council, its main legislative body, but then denied from taking up his seat over um, a dispute about the oath that he would swear. Um, and of course, was very involved in the protests um, last year uh, against the um, uh, attempt that ultimately failed to uh, import Chinese extradition laws into Hong Kong to, to, to enable um, China to extradite, um, which succeeded. Um, all of which makes the current situation with Hong Kong um, having had Chinese state security law imposed upon it a much more dramatic thing than the extradition law, which makes that all the more troubling and all the more puzzling. So Nathan, it's great to be with you. Let me start with um, uh, a simple question. You're in London now. Um, are you in exile? Well, I, I dare not to speak it um, on my own term because um, I, I've left Hong Kong and for now my, my, my future is still pending. So, um, yeah, but definitely uh, the, the pressure generated by the national security law indeed makes a lot of, much of us worry. And uh, for me, um, it's more than my personal choice. I think I have a responsibility to speak on the international level as a public figure about the danger and its uh, erosion to Hong Kong by the law. So for now, um, I'm, I'm quite active in the international advocacy front, and I hope that um, that could help Hong Kong's movement. So... Uh, to put it in simple terms, if we were conducting this Zoom interview with me here in Washington, D.C., but you not in London, uh, but in Hong Kong, would the kind of conversation we're going to have put you in danger of, of being a subversive or uh, anti-Chinese or whatever interpretation of this new law uh, the authorities might take? Well, possible, because uh, the law is written in a thick term that uh, it says that, oh, if you trigger hatred towards the central government, or you are asking for sanctions, then you'll fall into uh, the prescription of the law, and it will put you uh, to a danger of facing years of imprisonment or even lifelong sentencing. So that is such a draconian law that it, it was actually, in fact, uh, on, on its first day of implementation, there were already protesters arrested because of their carrying or they're in protection of the flags and slogan of the flags or stickers that have the slogans of the protest on. So it targets freedom of expression. So um, yes, indeed, it it has uh, it has uh, it has chilling effects in Hong Kong society. So that law was passed uh, midnight June the thirtieth, uh, right about yeah. two weeks ago, and of course June the thirtieth was the day in nineteen ninety seven that. Um, Hong Kong was handed over from, from Britain to China and the one country, two systems um, came into place. Do you think that that timing was deliberate? That that, that law was brought in on the day that um, Hong Kong's autonomy had been guaranteed? Yes, indeed. Um, it was such a rush for China to uh, publish uh, that law. Actually, what well, they didn't have the English version with them when they publish it. And we all know that Hong Kong's law are, are draft in English and we refer to English as the author, uh, authority language in terms of law. But well, by then, China didn't even 
have that prepared. And we can see how rushed, how hasty they, 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 they were when they published the law. And it's because they wanted to have a, a, well, a deterrence effect on people or uh, the, the state media would describe it as a gift to Hong Kong's handover uh, for uh, 23 years. But in fact, it, well, people still marched down to the street on the on 1st of July, which uh, was the anniversary of Hong Kong's handover. And people were still chanting the slogans and protesting to the government. So um, yes, uh, that was a political gesture by Beijing, but it didn't really um, uh, look good. Do you think that day, two weeks ago, was the end of one country, two systems? Yes, I would say that, because if, if we're talking about the core values of one country, two system, is first, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, and, and, and uh, second, uh, the high degree of autonomy, then uh, the, the national security law failed both of them. It introduced uh, the, the national sec uh, security agency in Hong Kong, which, well, clearly overrides um, uh, the, the authority of Hong Kong government and introduced the direct autocratic control in Hong Kong. So there is no illusion, illusion of uh, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong uh, ever since. And this is definitely the end of one country, two system, which the two system is completely subsumed and eaten by one country. So one of the things that puzzled me was Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, the pro-China chief executive of Hong Kong, had to admit she didn't know what was in the law. She wasn't even given an advanced copy of the law. Why would China so brazenly um, sideline even its own most ardent supporters? Well, it was, um, it was hilarious, absurd, but pathetic to learn that um, actually our top officials, they didn't even know what they were promoting. They were just salesmen who were selling products that they had never seen and they wanted people to buy it, and it's not gonna happen. So it was such a pathetic scene that we, we, we see that actually our officials, even though they're, they're not elected by people, they were still like handpicked by Beijing, but they were not granted any access to the information to this piece of law, which will completely reshape Hong Kong's politics and change Hong Kong's international reputation. But then yes, this is such a disgrace for the Hong Kong uh, governing body and for Hong Kong people as a whole. Uh, I mean, I imagine it's going to be quite hard for people such as you and the many people in Hong Kong, not just young people, the many people who came out, the millions who came out last year before the pandemic, of course. Um, it's going to be very difficult for you to reestablish a dialogue with the Hong Kong leadership when the Hong Kong leadership clearly don't have any power either. Well, yes, definitely. And um, we, we, you could just try to imagine like in Hong Kong for the past, for, like for example, for the first decade of one country, two system, then there were actually like rapid engagement of the pro-democracy came to the government. They tried to, to cooperate in some sense because they understand that there will be democracy. The pro-democracy came could one day be the leader of the city. So they have to cooperate. The, the, the pro Beijing camp has to listen to a certain degree to that opinion and they remain a dynamic uh, relationship. But for now, it's so clear that Beijing's not going to give Hong Kong people any power. They're actually collecting power. They're, they're actually um, making Hong Kong people and also the Hong Kong government in possession of less and less power. So they don't really have to care about the pro-democracy hand because at the end of the day, um, they will just crush them. So that is the case. If they don't value you, if they don't want to listen to you, it, like for, for, for us, we are so passive. Even though we wanted to engage with them then, but we of course knew that that will not be positive results. So why bother to do so? So the logic of that would be, you should try and talk to Beijing, but of course Beijing is not going to talk to you. Well, um, that's true. Uh, for the past, I think, for the we, we've got um, like people fighting for democracy in Hong Kong since eighties, and they had been having dialogue with the government for at least thirty years. But for now, we 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 have no sight of 
the government respecting Hong Kong people, Hong Kong people's opinion. So um, I think, um, yes, in 2014, we've got a slogan saying that the role for our dialogue has already ended. And I think that is pretty much also the reflection of uh, the, uh, the situation now. So something that really puzzles me and many people about Beijing's motivations here is that it backed down, well, Carrie Lam, the Hong Kong government backed down um, last year after this massive show of opposition on the streets of Hong Kong to the extradition law. And now it comes back with something much bigger, much, much bigger than the extradition law. It comes back with uh, China state security law, which ends the independence of the Hong Kong judiciary. It ends freedom of speech. It ends the stuff that makes Hong Kong precious and unique. Um, it's a doubling or a tripling of the stakes. Uh, why do you think Xi Jinping did this? What's, what, what is your reading of his motivations? Well, um, first of all, I, I think we should understand how Hong Kong protests reshaped the attitude of the world towards China and that worries Xi Jinping. Uh, and for the past decades, we've seen engagement policy, appeasement of policy, that from that Western world to China, that we expect them to grow themselves economically with uh, uh, well, democratic uh, democratization and uh, liberalism in the future. So that is a classic modernization theory. And uh, well, for the past decades, the Western countries wanted to see it happen in China, but the, the fact is, it is not gonna happen. And the incident of Hong Kong for the past year really um, uh, well, um, simplifies it or signifies that kind of failure of China open up and democratize by themselves. So it completely reshaped the narrative towards China and the world has been getting more and more assertive to the CCP and also Xi Jinping. So I think Xi Jinping recognized that and he, he felt that he had to solve Hong Kong's problem in a very quick way. So he adopted uh, such a draconian way, which I think he actually was misguided by his fellows, his, his, um, his policymakers, and made a terribly bad decision. Um, he, didn't, he, he thought that this would end Hong Kong's protest. This would end Hong Kong's, um, well, attention or spotlight, and Hong Kong become Singapore. But Xi Jinping is a huge admirer of the Singaporean system. But the fact is, well, anyone who has any basic understanding towards Hong Kong politi politics, we know it is not going to happen. People will still continue to resist. And when international media are retreating from Hong Kong, when mega companies are, are leaving, when Twitter and Facebook are discussing uh, their legal risk under the national security law, we know that Hong Kong will collapse. Uh, when the freedom of speech, freedom of, uh, 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 well, free flow of information and rule of law collapse. So I think Xi Jinping miscalculated everything. And uh, it shows that, well, he's, uh, well, policy, the, the, the core policymakers of his team is lacking of the understanding of Hong Kong, what's happening. And then when he is going to pay a huge price because of that, that kind of structurally, transformation of how the world sees China becoming more assertive or even more um, firm, uh, more hardline, will never stop if you continue to do it to Hong Kong. And, and well, there's only China to be suffered. So maybe he understands that. And so I'm sure it's a price we're prepared to pay. Um, we will make Hong Kong a ghost of its former self. It will cease to be economically vibrant. Shanghai has already sort of overtaken Hong Kong's role. We don't need Hong Kong. We can kill Hong Kong. Maybe he's, maybe he's making that trade-off. Yeah, I don't think that's the reality. Like um, most of the assets by getting the money into China are through Hong Kong. Uh, money out of China are through Hong Kong. It's rank one in Chinese city. And uh, for China, Hong Kong still, the figurehead of this like Belt and Road Initiative and Greater Bay Area because Hong Kong's professional service. We can never get 
finance yourself without Hong Kong. Basically, most of the uh, Belt and Road projects are financed in Hong Kong. So that free flow of information, freedom of speech, rule of law, and a well-established uh, financial system and cost uh, a very reliable court ruling system. These are fundamental values of Hong Kong and China needs it. So why should you be makes the move if he knew it? It's because he, he didn't know it, I think. He just miscalculated. And especially for now, you can see China is suffering not only international pressure, but domestic ones. Failure of industrial transformation, the aging population, desperate for hot money to flow in, desperate for um, sustainable um, economic model. And well, in this critical time, I don't see any intention of like getting rid of Hong Kong would be beneficial to Xi Jinping. So this is a miscalculation. Um, is um, it partly based on uh, um, a Taiwan, um, which has had um, you know a recent presidential election in which the Taiwanese, more pro-independence Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen, won a re-election? Um, and uh, therefore closes down near-term possibilities for a Taiwan reunification with China based on one country, two systems. Is, is that part, partly, do you think, behind this? Yeah, I think Beijing had already um, abolished uh, the role of Hong Kong as the exemplary city of one country, two system. Because um, in the very beginning, when Deng Xiaoping introduced one country, two system in Hong Kong, his prime target is actually Taiwan. He wanted to demonstrate that, oh, under the CCP ruling, you could still preserve your own way of life, preserve your freedom and, and what well, possibly democracy. Uh, and we could you, you, um, unite um, after it. But the fact is, uh, Beijing has long abandoned that kind of like exemplary uh, well, position of Hong Kong because they knew it, it is not going to have a peaceful reunification in, in this era. So there has been military intimidation to Taiwan constantly. And if you look into the shift of Taiwan's politics, um, even the more pro CCP, Kuomintang, KMT, is shifting their political narrative more far away um, from China, and the, the whole political scene in Taiwan is shifting towards um, a more well, a, a autonomy, a more autonomous or a, 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 a well, fully grounded political entity. So I think yes, indeed, um, Taiwan is a factor, but it's no longer, um, yeah, for, for for China, they 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 are losing hope of like peaceful unification. So if China has given up presenting Hong Kong as a showroom for Taiwan, yeah. as an example of what they could be with all the freedoms in one country, then that implies that the alternative to carrot is stick. Um, and, that the chi and that the China policy on Taiwan now is implicitly, at least, force, not seduction. Um, well, that's um, my view. Uh, there have been a lot of news about China trying to launch military inter um, implementation or like uh, economic um, welfare or, or, or on Taiwan. And I think, yeah, yes, indeed, they're heading to that direction. That's pretty worrying. Let's talk about the West's response to this. And before I get into what Trump's doing, what Britain's doing, um, let me just ask a larger question, which you've alluded to. Uh, about the West's assumptions of China's trajectory in the last 20 years. And the 1997 handover was part of that story. China joining the WTO in 2001 yeah. was part of that story. And the assumption always was that there is really an arc of history um, and there is an end state here. And the end state is you end up looking like us. The more developed mm. you get, the higher you climb the value-added chain economically, the more freedoms you have to provide, the more free flow of information you have to permit, and China will gradually come to democratize. Clearly, 
that bet proved to be completely false. The West misread yeah. China. What's to stop the, the West continuing to misread China? Well, I think uh, in that narrative, Hong Kong plays a major role. And before we, we, we thought Hong Kong is the pearl of Orient, is the four tigers in Asia, that it remains economically vibrant, uh, politically free, and um, people admire living in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a story that supposedly a free city, uh, a too big democratized one, and walk its path towards authoritarianism. And that kind of decline and, and shock and um, out of expectation really catch the eyesight of, Hong, of the world and also the, the Western leaders. So if Hong Kong are supposedly, uh, well, free city, or someone say that the beacon of uh, freedom in Asia um, fallen into the current state. So how come China could self-liberalize? So I think that, that scene of like people flowing into the street or even like um, aggressive uh, combatant um, uh, conflict from the people to the, to, to the government actually um, tearing off the disguise of China and really reminded the world, well, you know, something's wrong. So I think, yes, for the past year, when we recognize that the structural um, shift um, globally to uh, uh, of the China attitude, Hong Kong definitely plays a major role in it. How would you um, evaluate the Trump administration's response to um, Chinese imposition of state security law? Well, um, he's been um, giving out some quite um, assertive uh, well response, um, even though we, we need to observe whether it will realize in policy making or, or concrete policies, but at least his response is, is strong, uh, but sometimes volatile, as we all know, um, in, a, in every aspect. Uh, but for me, I think uh, it is not, it, well, of course, the, 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 um, the position of the president is important. But um, for me, um, we've observed a structural change in uh, both aisles in uh, the US and also possibly in the UK, that um, that kind of change towards China's attitude is not gonna reverse. And um, we, we, we could see there are bills passing constantly in the Congress and they are more aware of China's um, authoritarian expansion. And that kind of momentum will also influence the executive and to do more. And um, so I think, oh, well, that kind of structural change um, is not going to be altered by a president or by, um, well, an election results. It's all rounded and it is, is unstoppable. Do you think that the West, not just the Trump administration, but the West in general, is in danger of going from one extreme to the other as well in reaction to China's um, repression? Um, namely, it, it, it used to believe globalization was a win-win game. Now yeah. it believes it's a win-lose, zero-sum game, and we're in a, a new Cold War with China. Do, do, you, do you fear a new Cold War with China? Well, I think, uh, well, definitely we, 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 have, um, we have observed some trajectory towards it. But for me, I think what's most important is uh, we need to set up some principles when we deal with China so that we can hold them accountable. The first one is, uh, well, uh, human rights over uh, trade interest. We cannot sell our, our human rights um, well, uh, 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 requirement or we, we cannot allow uh, human rights violation just because we need trade with China. That's not right. And secondly, we need to have a coherent and united front. That really, that could really, um, uh, when China is seeking like trade partner, then we could stand firm and strong saying that, oh, you need to have like human rights clauses and you need to take care of the concentration camp in Xinjiang before you signed with any superpower in the world, including the EU, UK, the US, et cetera. 
So if, if we could have that united front, China has to be submitted into certain um, uh, mechanism to hold them accountable. So for me, uh, we are not talking about we have to destroy a country. We have to like have that kind of containment like we had to Soviet Union. It is not going to work because of globalization and, 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 and the development of the world. But we need mechanism to hold China accountable. accountable. And if they refuse to do it, we need to have countermeasures to do it. So I think for now, um, uh, I don't think the world is going to another extreme because uh, what our demands and, 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 and the mechanism in place are, are very legitimate. For example, for Hong Kong people, we just want autonomy and democracy. And these are promised inside the British Declaration. And for the world, if China can handle the human rights violation in Xinjiang, and uh, well, generally in, in uh, its own country, then definitely there will be, uh, 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 well, there, there will be enhancement on that. But we all know that China, China would, wouldn't do it by themselves. Its track record has proven that. So we need to have mechanism to hold them accountable in place. Well, let's talk about Britain, which has some kind of special responsibility since it negotiated this deal and is watching it being um, shredded. Um, the Boris Johnson government has taken some quite radical steps in recent weeks. Yesterday it um, announced it was kicking out Huawei from, the, uh, from British 5G. Uh, but more importantly, for, from your perspective, um, he announced that up to 3 million Hong Kongers could have long-term visas with possible British citizenship. Maybe probable, I'm not sure how you read that, but this is a big, this is a very big step, particularly for a government that, you know, is generally anti-immigration, um, to, to offer up to 3 million Hong Kongers uh, the, the right of abode in Britain. Uh, how many Hong Kongers do you think will take up this offer? And do you think the offer is sincere? Well, I, I don't think that will up to, um, up, up to million because um, like, there are lots of Hong Kong people are willing to stay in Hong Kong and, and do what they can to save throughout the city. But I think this is, well, first of all, it's a strong signal sent to China. It's not only the UK, um, uh, Australia, Taiwan, or even the US, they are proposing safeable plans, which means that the international community will recognize that it's a crisis in Hong Kong and they are eager for talented people there. We, we are a place that uh, have a lot of talented people and, and they, are, they are amazing. So uh, we, we can see that the attitude towards China uh, is, is changing very, very rapidly. And secondly, I think um, uh, that kind of policy is also telling the government that these people have options. Uh, if you uh, are going to apply more draconian policies and there will be consequences, um, for them, these people leaving is definitely not a sign of the of the city's development, and also, um, well, for the city's uh, future as a whole. So I think these are strong signals sent to Hong Kong government, and for the um, well, concrete implementation of the policy, I'm I'm not sure whether uh, well how it would go, but I think that uh, well, the UK government and also the government around the world, um, they, they clearly have um, observed that kind of like sentimental change in the public or in their parliament so that they have to make that decision. So that if the, 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 the UK government for now, well, they, they have some travel record that is not in favor to immigration, that there will be pressure from the, the, the parliament to push forward that policy. Um, in a moment, I'm going to um, give you some um, list of questions that have been um, coming up um, whilst we've been talking and others um, can still um, pose their own questions. Um, but let, let me just ask you to predict now what is going to happen in um, Hong Kong. Now, I understand because of the um, pandemic, you know, vast socially um, undistanced public protests like we saw last year are more difficult anyway. But of course, this new law gives the Hong Kong police much more power to, to shut them down before they even happen. So it could go one of two ways or, or points in between, um, which is that the Hong Kong people sullenly 
submit to this, complaining but not taking too many risks, or this triggers a, a higher level of outrage and um, it, it, it becomes a standoff between a rock and a hard place. Um, which direction do you expect it to go in? Well, um, I think after the implementation of National Security Law, of course, part of Hong Kong people, they will protest in a more subtle and creative way. But also there will be protesters that will continue what they have done for the past year, rally and um, to have contact the government. And um, there will be a lot of prosecution under the National Security Law. And if we look at the uh, September's uh, Legislative Council election, there will be many candidates who have won the primary uh, of the Democratic camp disqualified. And that will also trigger a round of rage from the public and the international community. But you would expect um, if there were an open and free and fair election now in which any candidate who wished to run was allowed to run, what kind of what kind of outcome would you expect um, from Hong Kong public opinion now? Well, essentially, that would be a sweeping victory from the democratic camp. And um, yeah, but I think that is unlikely to be happen. So here's a, a few questions. One is a personal one. Um, are you ever afraid? I mean, China, um, China's got a lot of power. It's got a lot of reach. It's got a lot of resources. Uh, it doesn't like people who embarrass it. Um, are you personally scared? Um, yeah, I was, well, after I served the council for a year, I was kicked out, I was jailed, I was, um, well, harassed when I uh, was at Yale to, to, to for my further studies. Uh, I, I reported to the local authority about tracking a message online, so risk. Uh, everywhere like I of, of course understand how extensive China could reach but that is also the reason why we have to do our work um, in this place and continue to do it because you are posing a threat to their grand narrative to their state propaganda and to challenge their legitimacy of terrorism and that's our contribution to democracy as a whole and contribution to, to Hong Kong so I think yes indeed uh, we are very worried but We'll continue our work and we'll try to be cautious, try to be careful, try to protect ourselves. When you were at Yale, uh, you, when you were harassed um, at Yale, was this by overseas Chinese um, members of the Communist Party? Who, who was targeting you? Well, uh, the, well, mostly well, overseas students, from Chinese overseas students, but um, yeah, you never know who's behind. So uh, for me, yes, indeed, um, the, the smear campaign from China has been huge. There have been a lot of misinformation, false, image, false accusation on me. And well, to be honest, I, I cannot combat the uh, state propaganda system in China. They felt uh, a huge firewall and they control all the media. But for me, I, I, as long as I could tell the truth to the international audience and to the people in Hong Kong, then I will continue to do so. Another um, personal question. Thank you for everything you've done for Hong Kong and the world to preserve democracy there. Can you share some of your origin story in activism? How were you prepared, trained for this moment in Hong Kong's history? What experiences or people have influenced you? Well, I think, um, well, being a politician or having a resistance movement in Hong Kong has, like, my life has been very turbulent and, well, in some sense, uh, volatile. Um, I remember that when I was disqualified as uh, the, the, the member of the, 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 the electrical, uh, after I served almost a year, uh, that was uh, July 2018. I was jailed in, July, in August 2018. Uh, that was July 2017, sorry. And I was jailed in August 2017. So I kind of degraded from uh, an honourable member of parliament to a prisoner in just a month. And that was a, such a, a huge uh, a, a, a change of status. 
And for now, uh, I was on a run for election. My pool was really high. I was by hugely popular. I could almost guarantee my victory if they allowed me to run. So I was a strong candidate. But for now, I became a person without like status and don't know his future. So you know, um, there has been a lot of change of way of life or or status or or mentality or um, state of life, whatever you call it, for my past four years of participation in politics. Um, the only thing I could do is I I stick to a core value that I truly believe. I stick to principles that um, I, I'm not doing this for myself. I, I, I'm penniless. I don't take any advantage of it. But I'm doing it for my people and for the people who suffer more than I. And um, by then, you feel actually relieved because um, you understand that there is a community of people that are working on the same goal and they have all sacrificed a part of their life and you're one of them. So get used to it and to continue your work. And that's how, how I convince myself to keep going. And I think it's important that we have a sense of responsibility and obligation to this community. So um, yeah, I, I think there's nothing really concrete to prepare your state of mind. It's just about how you think through things and be ready for changes in your life. Just to supplement um, that question, um, what was your upbringing like? What do your parents do? I presume your parents are still there in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, um, they escaped uh, from China to Hong Kong for better economic um, condition. I, I grew up in, um, in a public, public housing in Hong Kong public estate, uh, really blue color families, um, had a period of getting government subsidies to, um, to well, basically sustain alive so it was never um well it, it was never smooth and um affluent for me when i was young um uh, maybe that kind of background makes me more understand more understandable about people underprivileged people and and and, and the problems of the society and making me more able, capable of um, adjusting changes in life. It's interesting because a lot of people assume, I, th I think wrongly, that democracy is an elite concern. But actually the elites in Hong Kong are more likely to be close to China as they were to Britain. Um, and people like yourself come from fairly modest backgrounds. Is that, is that too much of a generalization? Um, well, I think um, there are different people well, participating in the political movement in Hong Kong. I'm just um, one of them. So, um, yeah, I won't say that uh, all like so-called elites are just pro-government and whatsoever. But for me, I think it, it, well, definitely we need people from different backgrounds so that we have a more um, all-rounded view on what democracy is about, who um, would uh, be like part of it and so on and so forth. So here's a question. Societies like Hong Kong and Taiwan shifted towards autonomy and enlightenment as its populations became wealthier and gained access to education. Now that the mainland Chinese have accomplished a level of wealth and education, uh, do you anticipate an uprising within China led by local Chinese or will fear of the CCP always prevail over any potential revolutionary trailblazers like yourself? Well, this is actually a modern, a very classic modernization theory, which there's a grow of middle class and they demand um, right of property, uh, a, a, a strong legal system and so on and so forth. And the government is forced to liberalize. But the problem is if we observe the trajectory of China that, um, well, the, the Communist Party is actually really capable of colluding everyone. They, they're, they're including everyone into the state enterprise. They set the party branch in every major companies and they recruit uh, students from a very young age, getting them into the young uh, Communist Party. And um, 
that well, state propaganda has been really successful, really powerful. So for me, I think uh, for now, if it is status quo, it's really difficult to penetrate that kind of like, uh, well, massive propaganda ideological system or what well, is like a person actually, as well by Beijing. And it takes a lot of drastic changes, economic difficulties, or some um, well crisis in in the nationalism narrative in order to crack down that kind of um, ideological dominance. So for me, yeah, if if China follows this trajectory, it will never change. People will have to um, collude with them, no matter they are truly believer of the party or they just an opportunity they will have to clue with them but if we see changes um, then there will be changes uh, i have a couple we, we're running out of minutes so just a couple of very quick questions that i wanted to ask one is from what you understand how different would be would a biden administration be from a trump administration in its handling of china including of course the hong kong aspect of that well of course i i, I feel like um the u.s they're actually moving towards the direction together for both aisles um well when i pay a visit to the u.s i met both secretary compel but also um a, 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 a speaker pelosi and we've got a lot of connection in both parties so i think as a very rare bipartisan issue in U.S. politics today. Um, I don't see any of the presidents elected would be milder or would turn into a more appeasement, more mild strategy to China. So I think that change is structural and is irreversible in some sense. And I think what congressmen, political force in both aisles will push forward to that direction no matter who is elected. Final question. How long are you going to stay in Britain? Maybe it's temporary, maybe it's long term. I've, I haven't been able to really have the resources to really think through and decide my future because fleeing is definitely not a well planned. Uh, it's not something you could plan ahead. So, um, yeah, let's see. Well, I know you're about to meet with uh, an all parliamentary group members of parliament um, on Zoom after after this call. Um, so uh, there's a great deal of interest in Britain as well as the United States and around the world in your fate and the future of Hong Kong. And I'd like to thank you for sharing so many of your thoughts and um, express my admiration for your resolve. Um, so thank you very much, Nathan. Thank and you so much. Thank you um, to everybody um, for watching.